December the 11th, 1936, and the culmination of a tremendous human drama. At, at long last, I am able to say a few words of my own. A young bachelor king, Edward VIII, is making his choice between personal happiness and an empire's crown. But you must believe me when I tell you that I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility and to discharge my duties as king as I would wish to do without the help and support of the woman I love. And so, for the second time in a year, from the ancient palace of St. James, a new monarch was proclaimed. March the sixth, by the grace of God, the great Britain and Ireland, and the British dominions beyond the seas, king, defender of the faith, emperor of India. <laughs> An empire's crisis had passed, but now a graver crisis threatened the civilized world. Abyssinia had followed Manchuria as a hostage to appeasement. The Rhineland and unhappy Spain were new milestones marking the retreat of the divided democracies from the principles of the League Covenant. And now it was Austria's turn to be engulfed by a ruler inflamed by dreams of world power. Speaking in his birthplace, Linz, Adolf Hitler declared that he had now fulfilled his divine mission to return Austria to Germany. Blinkered by apathy and bridled by caution, the democracies plodded through the years of crisis while the Berlin-Rome axis was being forged and tempered for war. In 1938, Hitler decided that the oppressed Germans living in Czechoslovakia, Sudeten territory must be liberated and massed his troops on the frontier. While the Czechs stood firm, Neville Chamberlain flew first to Berchtesgaden, then to Gerdesberg, then Munich, to seek an accommodation with Hitler. On September the 30th, anxious crowds waited to greet him at Heston Airport. This morning, I had another talk with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler. And here is the paper which bears his name upon it as well as mine. We regard the agreement signed last night and the Anglo-German naval agreement as symbolic of the desire of our two peoples never to go to war with one another again. The next day, Hitler marched, and the Sudetenland trembled under the robot tramp of Nazi jackboots. While Chamberlain and Deladier were debating how the map of Europe should be redrawn, Hitler was redrawing it. A year later, on September the 1st, 1939, Poland's western frontier was rubbed out. Now Britain awoke. An ultimatum was sent at once to the ruler of the Reich. Unless he undertook to withdraw from Poland by 11 a.m. on September the 3rd, a state of war would exist between Britain and Germany. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. It was summer and it was Sunday. For a few minutes after Chamberlain had spoken, a great quietness settled on the land. Then 